Well, last time we talked about uh, the fact that many genes can be linked. That is, they can be on the same chromosome and close to each other on the same chromosome. So that you see unusual ratios of progeny. You don't just see according to Mendelian genetics things happen randomly and evenly, but you see two traits that tend to be uh, in ratios linking each other. So for example, a lot of blonde people would have blue eyes. Uh, it wouldn't just be a random trait. Anyway, the, the easiest type of, uh, of gene linkage to talk about is sex linkage, that is genes which occur on the 23rd pair. So just to remind you, uh, the normal human uh, cell nucleus contains 23 pairs of chromosomes, or 46 chromosomes. Uh, the first 22 pairs we would call autosomal. Good word to know, autosomal. Uh, but we're concerned with that 23rd pair today, uh, which we'd call the uh, sex chromosomes. And um, because they're so important to human genetics, we give them names. Uh, we call one of them the X, one of them the Y. Uh, most people think of the X as being the female chromosome. The other one is the male chromosome, which is Y. Uh, not quite true. Essentially, um, when you look at the, um, the diploid condition, XX would be female, XY would be male. Uh, so if a woman can only give an X, uh, she would really not determine the sex of the baby. The sex would be determined by the man who can give an X or a Y. And the presence of the Y is, of course, what makes it uh, uh, male. Uh, these chromosomes are normally arranged uh, into a pattern called a karyotype. I'm sure you've seen them. You pair them all up. You line them according to uh, size. Uh, they are numbered, 1 through 23. And you take a look at the 23rd pair. And that tells you if it's going to be a uh, boy or a girl. OK, fair enough. Um, here's kind of a picture of those uh, sex chromosomes. So if you look over here on the side here, I'm going to switch my color. I don't think you can see that with red, really, because it's on red already. Here we go. Uh, here you've got an XX condition. Now they've caught the chromosomes at slightly different angles, but uh, essentially the same size, same pattern. And over here you can see uh, there's an X. You see kind of the X shape there. That's because it's gone through interphase. It's been duplicated, so we have two six sister chromatids. Now take a look at the Y. That's really what I'm interested in. Look at how much smaller the Y is. Uh, actually, if you look at evolutionary biology, uh, what people think is that the Y uh, really started out as an X, and the X kind of got destroyed a little bit, crumbled up into little pieces, and one of the pieces which remained uh, is the Y. So the Y actually has very little, so if you look at it, it's just a fraction of what the X is. It has very few genes on it. Uh, it has the gene for testosterone, obviously that's the most important one there, but it really has very few genes, so it doesn't really do anything. Think of the Y as being like nothing, really. Okay, so um, the problem that comes in here is that all the genes are located on the X. That would mean that whatever proteins are produced uh, on the X uh, females would have double the amounts of those proteins. And uh, that's not a good thing for many of those proteins since uh, they're both needed for males and females. So if a male only has one X, he's okay. If a woman has two Xs, she's getting double. So what happens is something called dosage compensation. And what that means is that uh, for some reason, one of the Xs, this is random, one of the Xs in the female gets Xed out and gets deactivated, and uh, it becomes kind of a dead chromosome. Uh, they call this a bar body, B-A-R-R, -R, and so it really doesn't do anything. So the net effect, though, is that even if a female has XX, if only one of them is working, that X is producing the same amount of proteins that the X would be in the male, even though he only has one to begin with. Okay. Let's just go back to simple Mendelian genetics for a moment, and you can see that it makes perfect sense. So uh, let's go start over here, right? This would be the woman, right? So the woman produces eggs, gametes there, which are haploid. And since a woman is XX to begin with, uh, based on Mendelian genetics, 50-50, uh, X or X, same thing. Those are the only two possibilities. 
But if you look over here at the male, uh, let's go ahead and put a male symbol in there, he has XY based on uh, what we know of meiosis uh, and Mendelian genetics. You'd have even proportions of X and Y. Fertilization, the two haploids come together, XX makes a diploid, XY makes a diploid, and so on. And you can see that, therefore, the ratios are going to be Mendelian. Probability of having a boy is 50%. The probability of having a girl is 50%. Very simple. Mendel would have loved that, right? Okay. Unfortunately, um, there are some genes located on the X chromosome which give us, well, what we would call diseases. Well, disease is not really a good way to put it. Um, a better way to put it would be you have uh, people who are affected, A-F-F-E-C-T-E-D, affected with a condition. So um, hemophilia we might consider to be a disease, but uh, I certainly would not consider baldness to be a disease because uh, I'm going down that road right now. I would consider myself to be affected uh, with baldness. Uh, muscular dystrophy and uh, color blindness are also really good examples of affected traits. So what do we mean by that? Well, um, if a male is XY, right, and the Y really doesn't do anything, and let's just put a little kind of circle up here to indicate that that X chromosome has the gene, say, for hemophilia, right, then this male over here, right, would be considered to be a male with hemophilia. Fair enough? But take a look at the female, right? Suppose a female has two X's, right? And each one of them has the hemophilia. Okay, she has hemophilia too, right? But there's a third possibility, isn't there? What if you have a female that's like this, and one of them has it, but the other one is normal. Let's put a plus up there for normal. Well, that woman has a gene for hemophilia, but she does not show the disease. She is not affected, is she? We couldn't see it just looking at her from her phenotype. We would say that ah, she's got the gene, but doesn't show it, so she is a carrier. And we'd have to do genetic crosses to actually see that pop out. Okay. Let's take a look at that hemophilia uh, example in a little more detail. So suppose we did a cross. Now remember, you can't see the genotypes. You can only see the phenotypes. Now this guy over here, he looks totally normal. If he's totally normal and hemophilia is a recessive trait, which it is, thank goodness, um, he would not have the gene for it. So his genotype would have to be XY where the X here was normal. Now over here we have a female carrier. She has a heterozygous condition. She does not show the uh, gene. She does not show the trait, but she's carrying it. So she is X normal and then XH for hemophilia. Let's take a look at her children here. What would be the possibilities? Well, if you run the uh, Punnett square, two by two, it would look something like this, right? Here's the male, right? Let's go ahead and write down our Punnett square. Uh -huh. And here's the female. And then she's got one hemophilia guy there. Let me switch my colors so you can see my answers here. Well, who would be normal? Aha, this would be a normal boy. There he is right there, yeah? How about this guy, a hemophiliac boy? Aha, that'd be down here, right? This guy over here would be hemophiliac. How about this guy, this girl? She's normal, right? There she is, normal, yeah? And this girl over here, right, would be normal, but she would be a carrier, yeah? Okay, she shows herself with the normal phenotype, but she's carrying a little surprise there, which might turn up later on. Now, this is really interesting. The um, the presence of hemophilia in the United States is actually very small, somewhere I think between 20,000, 30,000 affected individuals out of a population of 310 million. It's 
not a very big disease. It's definitely recessive, definitely sex-linked. Now, here's an interesting question. Uh, the only way that a female could have the phenotype for hemophilia is if she had both XH, XH. She has to be homozygous for the trait. It's very unlikely. Far more likely that the male would have it because he only needs to have one of them, XHY. So that explains to us why a lot of these sex-linked traits tend to show up in men a lot more than women. So when we talk about sex-linked traits, we're almost saying they're almost male-affected. Now, the only way the woman could have it is she would be homozygous. Why is that very unlikely? For a couple of reasons. First of all, the only way that she could get it, a daughter could get it, is if both mom was a carrier and dad had hemophilia. Now, that's a very, very uh, rare situation. And it's also socially very unrare, uh, rare because uh, women uh, tend not to want to marry and have children with men who have serious diseases. So if you're a woman and you're married to a man who has hemophilia, you know, well, you're already thinking the chances of my child having it are very, very great, so you might not want to have children with that man. So there's kind of a social connotation about it, too. Okay, uh, here's the last thing I want to talk about. And um, what we started in our conversation was talking about Mendelian laws. And then we sort of, as we learn more about it, we start looking at exceptions to it. So linkage uh, would not make sense to Mendel. That is a non-Mendelian idea. In other words, in linkage, his uh, second law, uh, law of independent assortment, doesn't really work, does it? In linkage, we don't get normal Mendelian ratios. Here's another situation that can happen, and this one um, goes against his first law, segregation of alleles. Now, what did he say? In meiosis, uh, when the chromosomes line up at metaphase, they then separate at anaphase. One goes one way, the other goes the other way. So if it's big A, little a, right? The big A would go one way, the little a would go the other way. They would not go together the same way. However, sometimes they do. Uh, chromosomes we found out in prophase can form chiasma for uh, recombination. And sometimes those little chiasmata don't break. And so when they line up in metaphase and then separate in anaphase, they might go the same way. Now, what might happen if this was happening with the uh, 23rd sex chromosomes? Let's suppose that X and X line up together. Now, they should separate. One gamete should get an X, the other should get the other X. But what if the two X's go the same way? Well, then you'd end up with one gamete, right, which would be XX, and you'd end up with another gamete, which would have no 23rd chromosome in there. Well, this is what we call meiotic non-disjunction. They don't separate normally. And this one goes against Mendel's first law, segregation of alleles. Now what would happen? Well, suppose then we have fertilization and they come together with normal chromosomes. Well, if this normal chromosome plus was a gamete with X, you'd end up with a baby who would have three Xs. We call this a trisomy or triple X, right, situation. Or suppose XX lined up with a Y given by dad, then you'd have XXY, right? We call this... Kleinfelters. How about the guy over here who had uh, nothing? Well, if that guy lines up with an X, so we get an X, that's XO, and that we would consider to be Turner's situation. Uh, and what if they line up with a Y? Well, if they line up with a Y, that one's not down here. I like to call it Yo. Yeah. Uh, why is it not found down there? Because that's a bed, dead baby. That's a miscarriage. Remember, the O is nothing, and the Y really had no chromosomes on it. So this baby is really missing all of its chromosomes it needs from the thir 23rd uh, position. So that's a dead baby. Um, these are all the possibilities over here. Uh, some of them are more common than others. Um, this one, X, Y, Y is pretty rare. But let's just uh, look at them for a moment. 
Uh, going back, we started with a conversation that if you get a Y, you end up being male, right? So who would be uh, male and who would be female here, right? So XX, that's a normal uh, female, XY, normal male. XO, don't have a Y, so that'd be a female. XXX, again, that's a female. XXY, Kleinfelters, that's a male, right? And uh, XYY, which is pretty rare, uh, would also be uh, male down there. All of these guys have um, um, abnormal uh, secondary sexual characteristics. Uh, a lot of them um, have abnormal heights. Uh, Turner females, for example, tend to be very small. Uh, I'm going to guess all of them are pretty much sterile. Uh, nature kind of has a control against this. And unfortunately, they have a lot of uh, internal problems that you can't see uh, that tend to reduce down lifespans.